think we're live now. So today, I'm very excited to be joined by Professor Osvaldo Gutierrez at Texas A&M out there in the uh, the sticks of Texas. But it is quite a beautiful area, as you can see in his background right now, for those of you that are watching this on YouTube. So Professor Gutierrez, how are you? Thank you for coming on. Doing great. Yeah. Thank you for the kind invitation. I really look forward to the podcast and I'm yeah. yeah, super excited to be here in Texas. So <laughs> yeah, it's uh cause I knew you came from, uh, from Maryland. And so that Northeast to Texas is certainly a change. I will say that I do miss the seasons cause I'm originally from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area. And so I do miss the seasons. Um, but having 60 degree weather in the winter is nice. The flip side of that is 105 humidity in the summers. So exactly, you know. <laughs> I think that's why um, it, it's kind of nice that it's so close to Mexico that you can catch a plane and go to Cancun if you want <laughs> in, in a given day, right? Yeah, so. I was I was in Cancun, oh man, five years ago, and uh, with a couple of my buddies from high school. And I mean, first of all, the beaches are just. I mean, it's just. I mean, you can't even dream of a like the white sand and the clear water. We spent a night in Cancun, the, the city, like we didn't like, uh, we didn't sleep there, but we were just out in the restaurants and the clubs. And I mean, it's a cool little city. I don't know. Like yeah. it was, it was, it was, uh, it was really, really nice. I don't know if you've been. Uh, yeah. And, and I guess I'll make a pitch for uh, Guanajuato for those that get a chance. There's mm. daily flights to um, Guanajuato, to Leon and Leon there to the small city mm. of Guanajuato that is like half hour away. And. And that's an amazing place to be at. Um, so if you do get a chance, go visit there. Yeah, Probably definitely the will. In the world, so. This kind of, that's kind of a nice transition because, you know, you were born in Guanajuato. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. My yeah. German, my German English is uh, not the best for trying for speaking uh, Spanish <laughs> languages. <laughs> uh, but you were born in Guanajuato um, and actually your family immigrated from there to San Francisco, California. Um, and so I, I was watching that documentary, at least parts of the documentary on the, uh, on your website, um, the house with the golden retriever, where I think the premise of the documentary is about what it, what the American dream is for immigrated people. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that's, that's kind of the theme of it. And, uh, yeah, you, you were discussing that you were born in Guanajuato, but because of the social and economic climate at the time in Mexico, you know, your family was like, we're going to move, we're going to immigrate. To California. Yeah. And so I'd like to ask you about that because, I mean, I know you also have like six brothers and sisters. So it was just like, were your parents just like, yep, we're going to move. And was that like a, you know, how was that kind of conversation? And, you know, what was that experience like? Yeah. So it's exactly, I think um, when we were in Mexico in, in Guanajuato is, is uh, we're actually in a very small town called mm -hmm. Los Rancho Los Prietos. And there is, it's a I mean, the size is probably at that time, maybe 500, 700 mm -hmm. total. Uh, and that's where I, my goal was to become a shepherd at that time. And that's because nobody really thought of ever going to middle school or high school. It was just something that you never see anybody around your town. So why we even dream about those things? Wow. So you kind of already had a, a set path of what you want to do. And that was kind of very limited by the opportunities that your parents had. Or your grandparents. In my case, my my grandpa was had several different goats, so I figured that I will take on the that family kind of uh, that part of, of of the job landscape and kind of become a good shepherd and make a living out of that. Mm -hmm. And my family really grew significantly. My dad was immigrating to the United States, like many other families around that town. And basically, by the time he turned seventeen or eighteen, usually the expectation is for males to go to the United States. And then come back before it used to be that you left in January, you came back in November, you spent a month in, in basically in, in this all December in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then you do that again and again and again. And that's how people just kind of assumed that was that was a good, a good uh, initiative to go to the United States. However, things started to become very challenging to immigrate, more expensive. So now families started to immigrate. And then the situation in Mexico started to become a little worse. So the idea is that my family... At that time, we were already six brothers and, and uh, six sisters. So mm -hmm. we were a very large family. Eventually grew to 14 total. And then my dad and my mom, 16. Uh, but yeah, because of, of the situation there in Mexico, we just felt that, that it was 
my dad felt that it was the best to to leave and, and go to, to Sacramento, which mm. is near San Francisco in, in California. Mm. Uh, during that during that time, though, <clears throat> so when you get to California, though, yeah. I know that there was the um, uh, Proposition 187, yeah. uh, which some people may know it as the Save Our State. Basically, it was an initiative to, I mean, uh, selectively keep state rights to the to the um the citizens so basically it was very difficult for immigrants to use public services in california so even that includes schools and um uh, what else i don't know everything was diff uh, difficult care yeah. yeah healthcare yeah yeah definitely social services basically you were shut down if you're an undocumented immigrant and, and it got really to the level that even education for children was almost thinking of you needed to have documentation to go to elementary Mm -hmm. So that that was kind of an environment that we grew up in. So and we ended up in in one of the probably one, one of the poorest neighborhoods in in, in whole California. Mm -hmm. That in, in Compton at the time, Oak Park and Compton were probably some, some of the worst ones that that you don't want to be at. Uh, and, and we faced many different issues with gang violence, discrimination, uh, mm -hmm. just the neighbors not making you feel welcome because you were another immigrant, right? So and in, in our case, it was a very large family, so there was a prototypical of you guys are coming here to kind of take our resources yeah ra rather than trying to provide basically something for this country they saw it as mm -hmm. uh, you're here you're the prototypical family very large family probably in footsteps probably and in, in want to get a, as soon as possible and, and asking welfare and all that and that was something that my family really never wanted to do as mm -hmm. easy as my mom was very very hesitant to ever asking anything from the government because of those situations i think yeah she didn't want to be part of, of that cycle even though we we probably would have benefited significantly from some assistance, right? Sure. But I think uh, nonetheless, at that time, it was it was a hostile environment for immigrants. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting because, I mean, you're the first professor, pers person I talked to that's like actually been discriminated against. So it's very, this is very eye-opening uh, for me because as a white male, I don't ever think about these things. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the, Saying that you felt the hostility, you could feel the xenophobia, right? Xena, uh, you mm -hmm. could feel it. I mean, that's like, you know, I, I can't, I can't imagine, I can't imagine. Um, but what was it about? Because you mentioned before, I mean, for immigrants, you know, let's just call it as it is. Many times there's a route to crime and violence, gang violence. You know, what was it about education that, you know, you really stuck to it? You know, you stuck to your guns. You know, what was it that kept you, kept you driving? Yeah, and then that's uh, that's very important that you, that you mentioned that when we left to, to from Mexico to the United States, mm -hmm. um, given the circumstances I made, I was actually supposed to stay in Mexico. It was mm -hmm. a very last minute decision. Every, half of the family have already arrived in the United States. My dad went and picked up basically the, the other half with the condition that I was going to remain with my grandparents. Uh, so I was going to live there. Um, but eventually a last minute thing happened that I was decided that I needed to leave as well. Mm. And I made that promise that if I ever arrived to the United States, I would never come back to Mexico unless I became a doctor. Mm. So I was with that kind of set mission. And I never questioned anything. I, I just figured that in order to become a doctor, so you better not join gangs. Yep. So I started doing research in terms of what is the prototypical doctor and what do you have to do to, to get to that point? And why a doctor is yes, because if you ever think about the American dream, you think, wow, if you become a doctor, then that's an achievable dream. And that's probably one of the, one of the best things that you could do. So I think like many other people, you just, uh, you saw that as a very um, good career that you could pursue and, mm -hmm. and obtain. And for that reason, I kind of um, basically made it a mission to not get into distracted or get into things that will put me in, in a position that will later kind of harm my way to becoming a doctor. So. Yeah, that's very, yeah, that's very, very. I mean, that's inspiring. And then you actually go on to do it. I mean, that's like incredible. That's just incredible. Um, so I know you're, uh, so you're doing your education um, in California. Uh, I know you're at community college for a little bit, but in 2006, you were then accepted to UCLA. So what was, I mean, what was that feeling like? I mean, it must've been like, I mean. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, was, I, I think um, uh, I was doing great in, in high school, but then I, when I found out that I was undocumented, that mm -hmm. kind of kind of shut down and kind of said, you know, you need to really re rethink your strategy about what you want to do in the near future, mm -hmm. in the immediate near future, and kind of put it a hold on becoming a doctor. But then eventually things 
one thing led to another that I was able to enroll in the community college. I spent six years at the community college. And mm. for me, I, I was living the dream. I was finally getting a chance to go back to the path that I always wanted to kind of mm. pursue. But when I went to, I just I started applying to different universities after year three at, at Sacramento City College. And I never got in. It was just the grades, my personal statement, something that was basically not not convincing the admissions committee that I was ready to to attend. But when I got in into UCLA, yeah, that was um, I had an extra few bucks to apply to UCLA, and that mm-hmm. was something I never really considered to even apply. It was not a dream. It was just something that wh- why wouldn't you apply to UCLA? That kind of a thing. When I got in, it just became super exciting. But at the same time, I was like, it's not going to be practical. I'm not going to move to LA. It's going to be too expensive. I was still undocumented. My parents, all, everybody in my family was undocumented, except those that were born here. And I needed to also help out with the family to kind of support them, mentor mm-hmm. them, and everything else. I just felt that, great, you got in. But but now what? You're not going to go, right? Right. And I just felt that it was... Why, why not take a, a road trip and go visit? It's probably the only time that you could feel that you want to get that experience of, of, right. of, of college. So we went there. I got really convinced by a professor at at uh, UCLA that Miguel Garcia Garibe, which, which actually is coming in a, in a few days to Texas A&M to visit. Hey. But he basically said, Osvaldo, if you come to UCLA and you get all A's, you're going to get into medical school. That's guaranteed. Because we have some of the top students here. So if you're able to, it's a, it's a competitive system there. So if you're able to outcompete everybody, then most mm-hmm. likely you're going to have a, put yourself in a good chance to, to get into medical school. And for me, I, that's what I wanted to kind of hear, something that it will guarantee something. Yeah. Okay. Of course, that, that <laughs> I, I don't think he knew that I was undocumented. So I think that kind of, uh, it was like, if, 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 with a caveat that you have to be documented, right? <laughs> Yeah. And eventually that turned out to be the point where I kind of diverged into chemistry rather than to medical school. Okay. Because it's medical school that you won't get embedded without basically social security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you're at USLA, yeah, you talked about you want to be a medical doctor. So I guess, so part of it was, I guess part of the decision of becoming a, a chemist was the, well, the, I guess the governmental aspect of being un- undocumented, but also too, I mean, surely there was some chemistry involved. Yeah. We were discuss- discussing a little bit beforehand that, you know, you were mentored by professor Kendall Hawk. Hopefully I said it right this time. Um, uh, who, Hulk and how, how, okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing that. <laughs> how, um, but you know, he, his group is a, I mean, they're huge in computational theoretical chemistry, uh, to solve organic and, bioorganic problems so it's interesting that you decided on organic chemistry but from a computational theoretical background that if that makes sense so yeah. I, I don't know if you want to discuss it with that a little bit and it's pretty interesting yeah but basically um i went there with the idea that i needed some research experience i emailed every single professor at ucla mm-hmm. for an opportunity and how is the only one that responded Mm. I could have ended up in being doing experimental and I would probably would have fell in love with experimental. That's what I do now. So I think mm. uh, it, it could easily be uh, you given an opportunity. So now is you have to take advantage of that opportunity. And I just felt that at that time, it was uh, the best thing that could ever happen to me. Hauk is an extremely great mentor. And yeah. he was there for undergraduate, something that at that time he had probably like 20, 30 postdocs. Yep. And his group was like 50. It was huge, humongous. But he still, he always had the door open that, I was not afraid to go and knock at his, his office, probably bother him too much. And because I didn't really know how big he really was, so I just kind of just thought that, oh, you're a, you're a teacher, you're a professor. Right. You should be open for office hours, right? Yeah. So for me, I was like, I'm part of your research group, so you should be there for me. And, and I kind of knock on his door and say, <laughs> hey, do you have a minute? And he was probably throwing off it every time that I got in there. I was like, oh, yeah, I just kind of want to talk to you about anything. That, that's yeah. kind of random. I'm having problems with with this particular problem. I saw it almost like a like a, a mentor, a tutor, a, a, everything on that end. And I think, mm-hmm. but eventually, I started to get the hang of computational chemistry. I started to really enjoy that research that I was doing. And then at that moment, I was I kind of figured that why not continue this trajectory because you're having a lot of fun with it. You find it challenging, and you actually saw an, an impact that experimentalists kind of saw in in, in doing the computations that. Oh wow, we didn't know that. That that could lead to the new way of thinking about this problem mm-hmm. and hopefully discover new reactions. And I was very fortunate to collaborate with a lot of great experimentalists, including Nobel Prize winner 
Dave McMillan at, yeah. as an undergraduate. So for me, that was kind of exciting at that time to, to be doing that and contributing to the field chemistry. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing if some students just send out an email to some professors, they never know what could like yeah, stumble exactly. across, honestly. Exactly. It, it, it is interesting though, because I can kind of attest to that because when I, when I applied to graduate school, I like I, I applied to Houston because I like the city, not necessarily any, knowing anything about yeah. the chemistry, honestly. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, little do I know, you know, I have Jeremy May, Olaf Douglas, Brad Caro, you know, all these high-end polymer chemists here um, and medicinal chemists. And it's like, wow, they're all right here. And I didn't even really know that. So it's just really, it's just really kind of funny how, yeah, exactly. that, how it works out, you know? Yeah. So in your undergrad, you know, what were some of the uh, projects that you worked on? Like how, like what were your initial, because I'm sure... I don't know, walk, obviously like walking into any um, high level research as an undergrad can be quite a daunting ca- task, especially I feel like a non-traditional research area. Now it's more, you know, now it's way more um, elucidated this computational chemistry. You know, I'm sure that's, you know, still kind of being pioneered in the early 2000s. Like, I mean, it's established, but like now it's really, really taken off. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so what was that, you know, what was, what were you doing and, you know, how was that experience? Yeah, I, I think uh, I had a conversation with Ken Howard that basically said, once you get to UCLA, we're going to talk about your project. Mm-hmm. I went in there and he had this, um, you went to his office, very modern looking office. I still remember the day that I walked into his office. He had a, a red kind of cabinet that had this little spiral. So yeah. basically, instead of opening drawers, you open one of the doors of the spiral. So, And then he <laughs> just kind of pulled out a, a paper from there and it was, Dave McMillan's uh, basically reactions that he was working on organic catalysis at that time. Mm. And he's, he saw, put up the papers like, oh, this looks good, good enough. And then he sat with me and he said, you know, we're trying to understand this problem. Dave McMillan at Princeton published this. And I was just thinking, blah, 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 blah. I'm not sure what, what, it, what he's talking about, right? I mm. barely took uh, organic chemistry too. He's like, but we're trying to understand why you get this product and not the other one, not, not the other in tumor. So we got to do some modeling. And at that time, I was thinking modeling computers. I hated computers. Yeah. I didn't like modeling. And I was, but I kind of saw it as, as a challenge. Well, I guess I'm going to do programming or of something. So I think he struggled to kind of tell me basically what exactly we're going to use. But once I got into using Gaussian, and it's very user-friendly. I saw it almost like a video game. Yeah. You try to basically compute structure, build structures, compute the energies, and then use the concepts that you learn from your textbook, organic chemistry, and said, what is a 2K cal energy difference between two things really means? Mm-hmm. And how does that translate into product selectivity? What is a 5K cal really mean? What is a transition state uh, as far as uh, basically, well, how do you identify and characterize a transition state? Mm-hmm. What is a lifetime of a transition state? All those things, now, now you start putting things into practice. And I kind of saw it as, as a nice kind of software video game that could mm-hmm. supplement any, any physical organic course. And for me, that that's what got me really excited into thinking, wow, this could be really profound, be very powerful, because then you understood that some things that you will struggle to to kind of know experimentally. First, mm. how do you characterize a transition state experimentally? Impossible, right? Yeah. You're not going to get an idea of the three-dimensional structure. And we base a lot of organic chemistry on three-dimensional modeling, the chair conformations, for instance, which conformation is favorable versus the other. And that can have a significant impact into what things you observe through NMR, through other spectroscopy tools. So I figure that this could be another tool to kind of provide information about molecular level information, really, about how things are really breaking and forming and the impacts that it could have in basically in designing new transformations. Mm. So I just kind of fell in love with it. So, yeah, it's that's, uh, I will say, while computational chemistry on the surface <clears throat> can be pretty daunting. Once you kind of get your foothold into it, it's pretty, it's kind of just plug and go. I mean, they're obviously like problem solving and mechanisms is not easy um, at all, but you know, it, it's, it is a little bit more straightforward, I think, than on the surface, I think. Um, and so um, I do like a little bit of the computational chemistry. Um, it, it is really fascinating, especially seeing those structures on your computer screen. I don't know. Something's really satisfying about it. So <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think what I can relate it to even experimental chemistry, where even the undergraduates, I tell them that it's probably going to be, be faster for them to learn how to do synthetic organic chemistry than computational chemistry, because mm. synthetic is just cooking, you're just repeating a recipe, right? And the idea is that if you have a new structure, then 
oh, that recipe to isolate this structure didn't work for this other one. Well, try the other one. Try the different column. Try a different solvent. And as a lot of it's trial and error. You just keep mm -hmm. trying things like, whoa, some other person reported this other method. When you have this other functional group, why don't you try that? And maybe that will able to speed up the basically the characterization process. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of those things that now they do a lot of hands-on and try things. But when you're in that computer, like, what do you try? Well, what is the next recipe that I should try? Yeah. Well, you also kind of give them in that sense, well, try this other keyword that that might make things a little more computationally expensive, take longer, but it might be able to allow the structure to converge and get the mm -hmm. vibrations. Try this other flavor of DFT or this other multi-reference method because there's no universal way of doing chemistry that's not experimentally or basically in the computers. Mm -hmm. So there's no universal function or there's un not un one universal way of characterizing compounds. Some compounds are very volatile. So a traditional column would not work because yeah. I mean, you try to, if, it, it's a, if it's a gas, how do you characterize a gas, right? So I think you have to think about the different tools and the properties of, of your compound. And especially when you don't know the properties of the compound because you're trying to make a new compound, Right. You have no idea of intermediates or side products, and you kind of have to have the more that you know, the more ways, uh, and the more that you're supposed to, of, of what to spec, the better. Same thing with computational chemistry. So I think the idea is that um, it's just another tool. Same mm -hmm. thing as NMR, same thing as a GCMS. It's, it's just another tool that you can use to characterize and get ide ideas about the mechanism or, or or the compound that you're trying to make. So Yeah. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. So... I know you said you made you made a promise years ago that you were going to go be a doctor. So I assume you know, as towards the end of your undergrad, you were like, okay, well, I guess it's time to go. I think you did a master's, but um, yeah. ultimately it was it was time to go for the PhD. Um, so was that an easy decision for you? Because I know you did it at uh, UC Davis um, under uh, Dean Tent, Professor Dean Tantillo, where you did more computational chemistry. You were studying um, catalytic. Um, re was it revealing? Um, Catalytic intermediates, or, mm -hmm. yeah, no, or organometallic species with with metals, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that was not an, an easy decision, and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's because um, you go with the idea that you think you have a path. I went to stream sacrifice at UCLA to be at UCLA, mm -hmm. so I, every week I was commuting from Sacramento, which is basically three hundred and fifty miles away. I was commuting every week, and it just kind of I arranged my schedule that I only basically took classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That way I showed up on Tuesday mornings and I left basically a couple of days after on Thursdays afternoons and mm -hmm. kind of studied from home in Sacramento when I didn't have pay rent and everything else. That became very impractical first because I got uh, too many parking tickets. Mm. And then also because uh, uh, of the time that I took and it just became, and I needed to sell the car because I needed to pay for the next tuition. So mm. Then I figured that I needed to leave in in, in Los Angeles. So I made, went through extreme sacrifices to basically try to get back in track of becoming a doctor and even became homeless so for, for when I was in LA as, as a student. Mm. Uh, but at that time, when I found out that I couldn't apply for, for medical school and I called them and I said, hey, uh, I was not preparing for the PhD. I, basically, that was not my, my career trajectory. I was going to medical school. I was doing all the right things to go into medical school. But when I when I tried to reach out to the medical schools they, and they wouldn't let me even apply, mm. that kind of just really changed my perspective and it kind of broke my dreams. And mm. at the point where I was almost thinking of, of dropping out. So I then uh, at that moment, I kind of just figured that I needed to come up with a different alternative, basically, that the medical schools told me that like, Osvaldo, you're classified as an unusual, highly unusual situation where you're not a U.S. citizen. You're not a, a permanent resident. You're not here on a visa. You can, you're not allowed to get a visa because now you're here illegally. So now if you go back to Mexico, you, you, you're not going to be able to come back. You're going to be penalized for 10 years automatically. Mm. So you're in a weird situation where there's no box for you. And mm. we don't know what to do with you. So I suggest to not apply at all. So uh, at that moment, I was thinking, so, okay, so no medical school. And that doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. Mm -hmm. it's not like oh hold on a couple of years like i knew that that holding on for a couple of years is still right now you're you're not i mean i will still be waiting right mm -hmm. so i i just figure what is the next other thing that i could do in the meantime and my grandpa was getting old so i made the promise that i was going to go visit him like i said i would go back to mexico and so he was reaching the 100 years old so i figured mm -hmm. that 
my time was kind of running out. So then I figured that, wait a minute, I can still become a doctor. Not a medical doctor, but I never said I wanted to become a medical doctor. I just felt a doctor. <laughs> These are a doctor. So I was like, why not go to graduate school? And and, and that's how that decision was made. Right? Mm. Basically, let's do that. Let's keep having fun. And if something works out later on, maybe I'll rethink my, my strategy if I want to go back to medical school or not. The situation presented itself later on in the future, but I would never trade for anything to to be where I am. So I was like, no, that, that's not for me. So yeah. So I guess I guess the question is, what's the difference between like why can't you go to a medical school but you can be a graduate student? Like, is there is there something in the laws that permits you from doing medical school? Yeah. Like yeah, it, it, exactly. So so graduate admissions is, is um, I guess they're on in terms of, of, of the PhD, at least in, in California, they, they had ways to deal with me. All you had to do was just, just pay that the tuition. Mm. And that was the same thing for the PhD, right? For the medical school. They said that you could potentially pay for, for that, but that means that you have to have an account with half a million dollars or something in, where you uh. have to pay that up front for that tuition. And for the PhD, they they were, I mean, it's professors like, like uh, myself that are in the admissions committee. So they... It, it was led more lenient in terms of you don't need to really pay for anything. We need to see your, your bank account. Yeah. Eventually, I, I needed to pay for for all the tuition, but at least at that time it was yes. We don't know what to do with you, but I'm sure we could probably figure it out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, the, the, they they didn't know, so I think that for me that was kind of clear. And for medical school, because you have to do residency and, and many different trainings at the hospital, mm -hmm. they will never allow you basically to be doing that without a social security because they have to do a background check and all those things. I as see. a graduate student, you really don't need a background check, right? So I think yeah. uh, as far as I know, that they never do any background checks on, on students. So yeah, I mean, maybe I maybe in Texas now they do. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So then ultimately, though, you do go to Professor Dean Tantillo. And so... You know, what was that work there? And because uh, I think UC Davis, which is in Northern California, I think it's also near, is it San Francisco as well? I forget. It's it near Sacramento. It's basically 15 okay. miles away from Sacramento and probably okay. like an hour away from San Francisco. I see. Now, I'm sure the research was great too, but I'm sure like, did you kind of move back? Because I know your family's for, like where it's up there. So is that like, that had to be part of the reason too, I think. Yeah, right? it, it was a combination. I, I figured that there's no, there's no way I'd be able to kind of support and pay for tuition and, and Basically, at that time, I think it was like $30,000 they have to pay for. You're supposed to get an stipend. I was not going to get any stipend for being a graduate school. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to pay for that tuition that comes with a stipend and everything and, and health and all that. And I figured that uh, there was not, no way I could do that anywhere else where I needed to pay rent. So I enrolled. I was paying the tuition. And I was doing basically dishwashing for, for a while mm -hmm. and eventually move up to become a server after the first year. And I figured that that allowed me to kind of just pour air, all my money to keep paying the tuition that, yeah. that, I, that I have. So. so how, but I mean, I mean, working in a restaurant and doing first year graduates, I mean, I can't even imagine that, uh, how difficult, I mean, that's, uh, I don't know what, like, what, what, what was it just the dream of becoming a doctor that kind of pushed you through that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I, I was actually, uh, I didn't found it as challenging. The mm. thing that I found it most challenging is the disappointment of, of, of my family mm. and my friends and the community that you grew up with. Because at that time, you came back as a fairly small town. Everybody knows you now. You, you're a hot shot. You went to UCLA. You got a master's from UCLA. So what are you doing dishwashing? Mm. And so you're doing the PhD, but you didn't want to tell people that you were undocumented, right? Mm. And then my parents were in a tricky situation. Like, when is this going to end? Mm -hmm. After the PhD, is that really, are you going to have a job after? It was like, no, not, not, not really. So you're going to get a PhD and then go back to this washing. Mm. But it was dealing with all, all those expectations that the people put on you, right? That if you get a PhD, you're supposed to be doing something related yep. to you, you know, something useful, I guess. And mm -hmm. Even the customers, when, when I was at the restaurant, I was like, hey, his father, you should really try to go back to school. I was like, I am in school. So like, mm. wait, I am in school. Just because I'm a dishwasher does not mean that I'm not in school. Right. Oh, but I'm saying go back to college or try to get a degree. Like, I have my degrees. I'm in the PhD program. What are, what are you talking about? So I think it's, it's people's expectations of, of what is to be a student, what is to be doing something. Mm. And, and my families and just kind of seeing the 
that's the, the moment that my dad was like, I don't think you're being a role model for the rest of your brothers now. Oh, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of disappointing now what, what you're doing in a way that you're supposed to be making it now. So what am I going to tell the rest of, of my brothers and sisters mm. that, oh, if you go to school, you're going to end up like me. Right. Yeah. So dealing with that was the most challenging thing for, for me on a personal that that's why I needed to kind of move out as, as soon as possible for, for mm. that kind of situation. So I kind of went back to renting. I lived on my own and, and basically away from, from the house because I didn't want to deal with that constant pressures from the family mm -hmm. or my neighbors or all that. And it was still in, in Oak Park. So it was still basically all the shootings were still going on. I mean, you get pulled over by the cops. They think you're a gang affiliated because of your skin color. So mm -hmm. I always had to carry the books with me. That, that way they would think that I'm doing something, right? Uh, you were still not allowed to apply for a driver's license, many different things. So you get pulled over. I mean, just dealing with all those things. And then, then you tell people that, oh, I'm I'm, I'm in college and, and all that. It was kind of an odd situation. Yeah, that is a that is a perspective I've never and like encountered or thought of. Like, yeah, you're like you're getting your PhD, but you're still dishwashing. I mean, that's like <laughs> the amount of pressure on that. I mean, man. Um, yeah. Wow. I, I don't know. That's that is a, that is a tough one. But you persevered, and so, you know, you kept on going. I mean, one day at a time, I suppose. Um, so you were at UC Davis, though, um, Dean, uh, Professor Dean Tantillo. So what was the work that you did there? Like, what, um, Yeah, I was doing uh, – I wanted – I went to Dean because he had a, a, a lab, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I could still do some computational chemistry to take advantage of, of my skills and still be uh, doing synthetic work. But at the same time, I – I, after year one, I realized that that was not practical. I went to the lab, I did some experiments, mm. and then uh, one, basically the postdoc that was there, he left. So I had a whole lab to myself. That's mm. not a good idea if you're a graduate student, right? Trying to learn synthetic organic chemistry, you being by yourself without yeah. any any people to to kind of show you the, the how to do things or for safety issues. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I figured I didn't want to put my uh, dean in that kind of situation because previously when I was at UCLA. Uh, a postdoc basically had an accident and died out of a, of a chemistry lab, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Died there, and that was still something that was still, it's still today that there's that basically we talk about the, that situation. Yep. How that kind of impacted lab safety in, 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 in organic laboratories and, or in general chemistry. And I don't want to put Dean in that kind of situation where I was putting myself in a very tricky situation where first I was still undocumented. No social security, no insurance. Basically, I shouldn't be in the lab even without insurance aid because then mm -hmm. they will check all those things. Mm -hmm. And then so I figure, I guess I should continue doing computational chemistry. Yeah. I was just kind of trying to take advantage of, of that situation and continue to do analyzing more complex problems in terms of from organocatalysis to now what happens when you evolve a transition metal, palladium, for instance, or nickel. How mm -hmm. does that change basically when you have data bond this? this carbon uh, transition metal bonds and that those interactions and all the complexity that comes with it, right? So now uh, I was involved with numerous projects on, on, on that end rather than doing experiments. Yeah, that's really, that's really I guess, um, thoughtful of you to think like that because, I mean, uh, you know, sometimes now I'm mentoring like our first year students in the lab and uh, I keep telling, I keep telling them like, <laughs> There's no amount of chemistry that's more important than your safety. Like there's, there's nothing. Um, so if there's chemicals that you don't know how to use, yeah. um, especially things that come in sure seal, things that are very pyrophoric, very volatile, um, don't touch it until like someone's got it. Someone else has to be monitoring you and someone else has to be in the lab. Don't, yeah, exactly. do, don't be doing anything that is because there's the pressure of getting the work done, uh, at least some students feel that way. But like I said, it's just, it's not import more important than your safety. So exactly, exactly. That's, Nothing really is. So mm, that's very, very cool that you um, thought that way. Um, but at the conclusion of your uh, graduate studies, you know, I guess a natural question is what's the next step? Because now that you're a professor, most, I feel like 99% of the time you need a postdoc. So, you know, did you do a postdoc and, you know, what was that transition? Yeah, yeah. So at that time, I basically was preparing myself when I was uh, dishwashing and, and serving tables and all that. Um, 
I was preparing myself to graduate anytime as soon as mm -hmm. possible. And it was kind of clear when I asked Dean, uh, Ed, I asked him, what are the expectations to graduate and get a PhD? He's like, well, you have to finish your classes that are required. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I, I think everybody in my group publishes about five to six papers. So wow. I think the idea is that five, publish five to six papers and uh, write your thesis. I was like, sounds good to me. Yeah. And by that time, I, I, I published within, I think, 12 papers. Mm. I, and basically, I was ready to graduate at any point. So when when President Obama uh, announced in June 15th that on 2012 that he announced on my way to UC Davis that in the radio that um, people like me could get a social security. Wow. Okay. Um. I couldn't believe it, right? Mm -hmm. It was just a very emotional day where you had to stop the car because of all the emotions that that come yeah. to you at that moment. So I had to stop the car because I, I knew, knew myself getting too emotional with that. I still get emotional with it with that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that moment, I, I remember the parking, getting to UC Davis, going straight to Dean Tantillo's office and said, Obama just passed this law that I now I'm going to be able to, to get my social security number. So I want to graduate. That's incredible. And, and he said, yeah, like I said, I just want, once I think you're ready. I mean, once it, at that moment I was, uh, uh, basically kind of start my fourth year. So with, I, I spent three years as a PhD student He said, just write your thesis and, and yeah, you can graduate and find a position. I mean, you, you want to have a postdoc. If not, you can stay, you still have two years left that you can, or, or more that you could stay. So, but I figured I, I needed to change. So I went to the coffee shop. I basically uh, finalized my thesis because I already had it written. I was ready to basically move on at any given point. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then I emailed different professors, just the way that I, that I did with, with going from Sacramento State College to UCLA. Hey, I'm going to graduate. Do you have a position open? Do you graduate, do you have a position open? And it... It turned out that Marissa Kozlowski at the University of Pennsylvania said, yes, I do have a position open. I want to interview. Send me the letters. So I quickly told her all my advisors to send the letters. The next day I got an interview with her. And she said, and then a couple of days after, he's like, I'm going to give you an offer. So everything moved so quickly. So then basically less than a week after that, I already had a position at, as a post like at, at University of Pennsylvania. Mm. And then I graduated because I, I told him, oh, I, have, I have my thesis ready. Here it is. Just signed it, that kind of a thing. So then quickly moved in and went to Marissa Kozlowski because I could still do computations, but now I could actually go back and and see if I could explore my my skills in synthetic organic chemistry. And that was the idea that if I go there, she would basically put somebody that would train me in synthetic organic chemistry as I train basically people in computational chemistry and work on computational problems. And that's why wow. I did during my time at as a postdoc, I spent five years doing both computational experiments. I, I tell students I spent twice as much time as a post like than I did as a PhD, right? Uh -huh. Because I, I want to learn both and kind of a, and, and have fun with that. And and I really, really enjoy my time at, as a post because finally you don't need to worry about all that social security, all those other things that you just kind of focus on on doing chemistry. Yeah. Right? I mean that's got the biggest weight's got to be off your shoulder now. I mean that's just yeah. I yeah. I can't imagine that that like on the radio. Yeah. Uh, like man. Did, now, did Dean Tantillo knew you were undocumented at any point? Yeah, like, okay. yeah I, I think it came as a surprise to him, but I think uh, he was more supportive than, than anybody. I mean, him and, and Ken Hauk really just changed the system in a way that now at UC Davis, they have a protocol, they have a way to deal with students like, like myself. Mm -hmm. At UCLA, they have ways that if you're in DACA, if you are undocumented, but if you got into the PhD, they had ways in, in to basically make you succeed in, in mm -hmm. those programs or pay or tuition and all those things. So oftentimes when I, when I tell this story, I always get some, some kind of students that go, I, well, I didn't know that. What about this other ones? Like in your personal statement, be very, very upfront, mm -hmm. very interested in your, in your PhD program, but I'm documented. So if you get admitted, they already know that, that you're in that situation. So already have a protocol. If mm -hmm. you don't get admitted, then probably they don't have a protocol or it just happens that, you're going to find another program where they will know how to deal with you. But the worst is you apply somewhere. And then after you get in, 
you find out that they don't have any established protocols to deal to deal with the situation. Mm -hmm. And now you have to kind of rethink your strategy or what, what you want to do. So I think the more upfront that you are with, with people, the, the better you're going to be on, on that aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, just on deciding to do the, the, the postdoc, I know you mentioned like, I mean, I, I can only imagine things are moving like a hundred miles an hour at this point. Cause like you're trying to get your thesis done. Obviously you finally get your social security. So I can only imagine like, those are really the only things going on in your head right now that perhaps the next steps weren't like as the, biggest priority, I guess. But um, so did you reach out to any industry at all? Or, or like you were just kind of reaching out to different professors uh, for postdoc positions? No, I, I reached out for different professors. I, I didn't want to ask that. Uh, when I was at UCLA, I work in industry. Mm -hmm. Of course, with, with different social security number and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Right? Sure, sure, sure. But, I, but I worked there, but I realized that that was not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized that um just the eight to five regular schedule job it was not for me. So anything mm -hmm. that had to do with a regularly scheduled job, it was not going to work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so unless somehow industry said, actually, you can work whenever you want. Anytime, we're not going to check on you, whether you work from home for you. Just show and give them their reports. And I figured that, that they're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and they still don't do that. So I, I think the idea is that to have a regular scheduled job it was not, was not going to cut it. And I figured that, now I kind of found a, a basically a career where I could potentially find myself succeeding and being happy. And, and that's why I want to pursue the mm -hmm. professor. But at that time, I was really thinking about a professor in terms of Sacramento City College professor, teaching, mm -hmm. professor, <laughs> not, not not a university professor. It was not until Marissa Kozlovka kind of gave me the confidence that, that they was like, okay, I can, we can prepare you for, for that career. Mm -hmm. And then she started involving me in many different mentoring grant writing. She's worked with me one-on-one -on, -one on different aspects. But at that moment, I was just thinking, professor meaning community college where I could teach, mentor students, kind of basically office hours, teaching organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then I go home and hang out with my friends and we're yeah. going to be happy and that kind of a thing. And summer's off and winter's off, that, that kind of thing. And yeah, it's, that's, uh, I mean, that's honestly quite a really, I mean, that's a perfect post. I feel like that's a perfect postdoc experience because I'm sure you have a great advisor, but also, I mean, living living in Philly, great yeah. city, but yeah. also the way that you did it. So you're teaching computational chemistry to students, but you're also learning the synthetic end of it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that you're now you're now, a, I mean, the very versatile chemist. I mean, as versatile as they come. Um. So, what were like some of the rewarding aspects of of that? Like, what was, um, just teaching and then. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think some of the most rewarding things at at Penn were basically is it's a different feel when you make a compound, right? When you mm -hmm. characterize a compound, and after years actually characterizing a compound, so it's supposed to be like another uh, project. Like, well, I didn't mention this, but basically, Ken How when he pulled out the project out of his red cabinet, <laughs> he said, "This is supposed to be an easy project for an undergraduate," and then oh, boy. <laughs> after three years, he's like. Oh, I, was, I feel really bad because uh, that's supposed to be an undergraduate project. It was not supposed to be something that you spent years trying to solve and, and kind of, uh, uh, it was not supposed to be that complicated, right? I think it happened the same thing with Kozlowski, Marisa Kozlowski's project. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be something where somebody like me with no prior experience could quickly do. Yeah. Get confidence, build some confidence, build your skills, <laughs> and basically I publish a paper really quickly and then that will make you feel that you're, you're ready to... It's not supposed to be something that takes you five years to do, right? It was yeah. not a synthesis, but it definitely felt like a total sense of a molecule, <laughs> even though it was basically four steps. Right. Like, this molecule was very tricky to compose it. It was all those, it was, it was a project where you really push your patience and see if you, if you really want to do this. Right. And then the mechanistic studies to build those mechanistic probes, again, it was that, why are you building those mechanistic probes and how important this is? And I think it was very important because I, I was trying to combine computational chemistry so I, I needed to convince myself of that it could be done and, and then also that you could potentially mentor this and this could accelerate reaction discovery so mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah it, it came with long hours but I think it just a feel of learning how to make compounds right correct right and learning all those instruments would be very cool for me yeah in the brief time that we have left uh, I do want to discuss with you uh, the projects that you work on now. So uh, you were a uh, university professor at University of Maryland, but now you're at uni uh, uh, Texas A&M. And so um, I know you do many things there. Uh, I'm particularly interested, though, in your 
iron catalyzed uh, radical cascade cross couple reactions, but also I guess in a more general sense is uh, base metal, you know, i.e. cobalt, um, iron, and nickel asymmetric cross coupling reactions. And so, would you be able to kind of describe those those research projects? Um, um, we can we can kind of dive into the the scientific jargon a little bit. I think we can describe that a little bit, but I would like to you know for you to describe it because I think it's really cool stuff, honestly. Yeah, yes, I, I think how we got into iron chemistry is was simply mm -hmm. that. It was still a challenging to understand the mechanism because you ask any graduate student, what is the mechanism of an iron catalyzed cross coupling process? Something that has been known for 70 years. People struggle to even come up with or even propose a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt that maybe computational chemistry could assist on this end. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people that are now that I collaborate with spectroscopy that were trying to basically get insights into what potential intermediates you have. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there's a lot of surprises. Not too surprising, but there's a very complex. Uh, that is highly reactive species that they adapt numerous different spin states and coordinations and, and all that. But there are some general trends that are going on. And, and I think what we want to do is basically create a control catalytic system, control in a sense almost to the level of palladium where it's a well-behaved kind of square planar complex. And that square planar can be tuned as you like to increase the electronic and hysteric parameters. Mm -hmm. In this case, can we do the same thing with an iron complex that is well, can we make it well behaved to that degree? Can we rationally kind of design a, a system where we control the spin states as well? Mm. Right? And if we do that, if we are able to control the spin states, then we might have access to a, a unique kind of catalytic system. And it turned out that that's the case, that this system that we have, we're now building that it could promote a wide range of radical cascade transformations and then do carbon-carbon bond formations so cross-coupling at the end. So it's able to build radicals and do carbon-carbon bond formation with radicals. Mm. And that's something that uh, we didn't thought that it was going to be possible in, in the situation because of the complexity of involving three components rather than two components. Two components were already challenging enough. Mm. And then gluing two components in asymmetric fashion extremely rare in iron catalysis, even though that yes. is it basically there's numerous reports with palladium chemistry and uh, other transition metals. But with iron, there's still like maybe one or two reports that are higher than basically 90% EE. So we figured if we can basically understand the systems, yes, like computations have aided in in the basically in the elucidating the mechanisms and in designing new ligands, maybe you could do the same thing for iron chemistry. Mm -hmm. And if you do the same thing, then maybe we could get it to the level of palladium in, in, in terms of understanding, controlling, and designing new transformations. And that was that's our focus right now. So yeah. all of my students right now, they do experiments and half of them do computations. So it used to be the other way around that everybody did computations mm -hmm. and very few do experiments. But I think now they're shifting more so of doing more experiments and supplement mm -hmm. with computations in it. And I think with the, the systems that we're doing, it, it could definitely provide a viable solution to cross-coupling reactions and an alternative to more precious or more expensive metals and then so on. So. Mm. Yeah, I think I think this is a very exciting and promising area because like you mentioned, you know, metals like palladium, which are, I mean, as well defined as they can get, we understand virtually anything you want about palladium. We understand it. It's also a very simple system. So most of the time it's, you know, between the zero and two oxidation states. And it's well behaved, but if you could explain the problem with iron, because I know with iron, it can access two electron transfers, but also single electron transfers. It can access, you know, oxidation states from zero. Well, really, technically speaking, I mean, you know, negative two to four, but in most transition metals, it's in catalysis, it's really between like zero and three mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think in iron, once you add grainers to it, very strong nucleophiles, then things could get out of control because we don't understand even the complexation of Grainers. Mm. Like, well, what is, what is a Grainer reagent? And and how does, basically, we could this kind of do, if we teach organic chemists, well, if you assume that it's a carbon with a negative charge and that's what does the reaction, but we're ignoring all the aggregation and things that are known out there to, to happen with Grainers. Mm -hmm. So once you combine the Grainer reagent and an iron system that, again, is, you have no idea of, of the spin states and, and basically the coronation and you could adapt numerous different things, then it becomes very complex and very challenging. So the idea is that how we how are you going to create a system that is kind of that is well behaved, right? And mm -hmm. I think with iron, it can still adapt 
numerous different spin states, numerous different coordinations. But what we do to control that is first, we do a slow addition of the cranial, some of the strategy that has been used before to kind of minimize the aggregates or minimize mm. the, the potential interaction. So you have a very low concentration of cranial. And then we use a ligand as well that kind of binds to, to the iron that is able, that people have shown that it can bind to the iron and coordinate to the iron. And the idea is that if you add the cranial too fast, then you also kind of spell out the, the ligand because it's not as, basically it's, it's doesn't have a strong interaction with iron. It's mm -hmm. a very weak type interaction. But in the slow addition of granular, then you might be able to have a control system where by slowly adding the granular, you have a control reaction that kind of turns over one thing on it, basically one at a, once at a time. So one reaction at a time in a way. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do the, the slow additions though? Is it like, are you do like, are your students like doing it by hand or do you have like a, a mechanism to like push it? Yeah, we, we used to do it by hand, but now, uh, Early on, we discover that your slow addition might be different than undergraduate's slow addition. And Certainly. So I think we decided to use scope for a more systematic analysis of syringe pump that it could be mm. calibrated and basically uh, programmed to to add a certain amount over a certain amount of period, mm. and, and that becomes more much more reproducible to do chemistry. And I think that could actually be a more practical solution in it if you want to do it in a large scale where. Engineers are, are are trained to kind of program pipes to slowly open and slowly add a, a certain reagent. So mm -hmm. what we see it as, as as that. So we use syringe pumps to do that. One other, one other thing I want to ask you is about just on the if you could explain the what you know what spin states mean for mm -hmm. for um, iron. I, I know that, that the general public might understand this, but for all, all the chemists out there, you know, this might be a little little helpful to understand why iron chemistry is really difficult to understand. And I think you saying that if you control the spin states of iron, I mean, that would be huge, huge. Yeah, yeah, because I think uh, uh, the idea is that, let's say you have even number of electrons in the outer shell, right? Mm -hmm. And then usually as we thought in, our, in, in general chemistry, they want to be paired basically from the lowest energy levels to the highest. So you basically populate the lower energy levels and you pair them up. So if you have an even number, then it's all pairs, so the, basically the spin is, is zero in, in those situations. But with iron, is tricky. The energy level gaps are not that different. Basically, mm -hmm. they're they're all kind of almost equally. So there's an equal almost chance of populating one. They're almost degenerate levels, right? Energy level, and the tendency to basically to pair them up is not as great either. You, you don't gain much by pair than pairing the, the electrons up in, in a lot of the systems that actually having an unpaired becomes maybe the more favorable structure mm -hmm. but now you have a system that kind of is, you don't know if it's going to be preferred and it's very sensitive to the energy levels by the ligand that it coordinates is very sensitive by the solvent is very sensitive by numerous things that in principle you could assume that it could generate any possible basic configuration of electrons and that becomes tricky right because then if you don't know how the electrons are kind of uh, populated then you could have numerous different configurations and, and you might have in the, basically in the intermediate before it goes through the certain transition state, you might have a certain configuration that is favorable for that. Let's say they're, they all want to be paired up, but then in the transition state, if it's going to help to basically decomplex the ligand, adapt a new configuration mm -hmm. to speed up the reaction, so you lower the barrier, then it will do that. And palladium, let's say a lot of those metals, they don't do that. They just go with one certain basically configuration and they never kind of basically uh, uh, break the spin. But in this case with, with iron, it could, is able to do that. And that could be an, an attractive and, and, uh, and something that you can take advantage of because you have a way to kind of speed up the transformation by changing the spin state, not necessarily mm -hmm. the coordination, not necessarily just if you're able to modulate the spin state, then you can sig have significant barriers, lowering, and, and that could speed up the transformations on this complexes, but how you do that is still very, very, very tricky. Okay. Now, do you have any uh, suspicions on how you can begin to understand the controlling the spin states? Are you, are you doing it kind of computationally or do you have any experimental data? that's like, okay, we seem to try this. That seems to help it a little bit. Yeah, well, we have extensive computations, but the problem with the computation is that we don't know which method is really predicting the, the right thing because one computational mm -hmm. method might predict that this complex should have this specific a spin state and this other method that's supposed to be more accurate predict that you should have this other one but in reality then you will see what was has anybody characterized that intermediate and now a lot of people have 
characterize some of those intermediates. Mm -hmm. And they predict a completely different spin state. So now you have to think, well, what's wrong with the methods? Mm -hmm. Or maybe choose a different method that's able to replicate experimental data, but for reasons that you don't know. And be okay with that because that will help you out to basically start designing new transformation. So if you assume that this method, for whatever reason, is able to capture the actual spin state, the coordination of this intermediate that has been observed with all these different limitations, then maybe you could use this method, even though mind might be the best method out there, even though the, the theoreticians might say, well, that's a method they shouldn't be using for iron. It's like our justification is like, wait, but this is the method, whether you like it or not, is the one that is able to replicate numerous experimental evidence. Uh, so okay. the idea is that then we use that to then design the transformations. And if it turns out that it becomes predictive, then we have a winner, right? Mm -hmm. And again, we just have to be okay with, for reasons that we don't completely understand why this particular method is able to reproduce that and why other ones are doing something completely different. I think that's, that's something that is still unsolved, but I think mm. it's, getting to the, to the, it's getting there to understand those things as well. Yeah. Well, Professor Gutierrez, I want to thank you so much for your time and consideration. It was really awesome getting to know you, honestly, but also just talking your science and your story. I think I'm I'm really looking forward to your your future, what your lab has to offer coming. To, I think it's very exciting stuff. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was yeah. a pleasure. All guys, um, that was episode 27, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.